session today on political systems, politics, and the formulation of coastal temperate rainforest policy in the United States and Canada, you're in the wrong room. Uh, but for those of you who are here for it, welcome. Um, I do have a couple of preliminary remarks before uh, we get into the bulk of the program. Uh, many of the people who were instrumental in the formulation of the center have been acknowledged throughout the course of the symposium in the last two days. But there are two people who were instrumental at the very beginning and are, in fact, unknown to many even in the uh, membership of the center itself. And I'd like to particularly acknowledge Brendan Kelly, formerly at the University of Alaska and now with the uh, uh, National Science Foundation and uh, Linda Kruger of the uh, uh, PNW here in Juneau. Also, uh, Linda and Rick Edwards uh, were the chief organizers of this panel and I'd like to express my appreciation to them. Our session today uh, is reflective of the aspirations of the center to serve scientists, resource managers, and communities coast-wide, not simply in southeast Alaska, not simply Alaska. And uh, that really um, led us as a work group in planning the session this afternoon in our belief that one avenue to a better understanding of this network coast-wide is to compare the political and management systems in place. Uh, our format today will be just a little different uh, than uh, others so far in the conference. We'll begin uh, by hearing uh, from Martin and I and jo uh, George uh, Hoberg during our first roughly hour. We'll do a quick stand up at that point and reconfigure the room slightly so that we'll have a full panel who uh, will initially, uh, I've never used the word with George or Martin yet, interrogate them. Uh, but to ask them questions. I, if I told them that it was going to be an interrogation, they might have had a different view of it. Um, and uh, after that, to uh, engage within the panel itself uh, a discussion of uh, their uh, presentations and reflections on those wider implications. Later in the two-hour program, we will uh, open it up to all comers. With that, uh, let me begin uh, again Diverging from the program, we're going to start uh, with uh, Professor uh, Martin Nye. Professor Nye is a uh, professor of natural resource policy in the College of Forestry and Conservation at the University of Montana. Uh, his research and teaching focuses on federal lands, resources, and wildlife policy planning law and management. Uh, Martin received his PhD from uh, Northern Arizona University and his bachelor's from the University of Nebraska. His latest book is The Governance of Western Public Lands, Mapping Its Present and Future. Martin, welcome. Bring you up first and I think that was a good idea. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, I really appreciate the invitation to be here. Um, I'm just always in awe of this place. Every time I come back, just in awe and a sense of humility, I guess. Just the, the, the landscape, the people, the, the, the deep, rich history, the cultures. Uh, and I think it's some of the humility also comes from me trying to understand the politics and laws of this place that can be a bit intimidating and overwhelming at times. Um, 
So what I would like to do uh, today is try to, instead of talking about the Tongass National Forest as an outsider, uh, talk a little bit about what I consider to be some of the most significant trends and developments in national forest law and management in the lower 48 states and place the Tongass National Forest in that context. Um, but before I do that, uh, so I'll, I'll just simply describe what I consider to be some of these very common themes and, and uh, defining characteristics of some of these collaboratives that are going on in the Western United States. But before I do that, I'd talk to, like to talk a little bit about how I got to this place. Um, about in 2004, 2005, I was writing a book uh, on the governance of Western public lands, trying to understand a little bit about environmental conflict and how we've managed those conflicts in the past. And I naively chose the Tongass National Forest as one of my case studies. And, and three years later, and two summers of research up here, talking to over 50 people, digging into the archives, um, I finished that case study in, in that chapter. And I've tried to stay engaged since that research. And, and what I try to do in that project, I just ask three very simple questions. What factors drive conflict over the Tongass National Forest, which I consider to be one of the most intractable environmental conflicts in American history? Uh, how have those conflicts been managed in the past? and how they might be managed a little bit differently in the future. So as you can imagine, I found you know, some of the conflict is due to just very different visions of what Southeast Alaska does for a living and where it should go. So some of it is due to competing values and political interests, and that's unsurprising. But I also found that some of these conflicts are driven or compounded by uh, particular political institutions and decision-making processes that make these controversies even more controversial. Um, an example would be some of the overlapping and competing uh, statutory language like the Tongass Timber Reform Act and its mandate to seek market demand, which invites legal interpretation and conflict. Um, so, you know, I, what I also found is that um, there are some of these conflicts that Congress has failed to answer in regards to how the Tongass should be managed. And what happens as a result are some of these conflicts get pushed onto alternative pathways. So we end up debating some of these issues in, in round after round of forest planning processes or appropriation politics or executive involvement and the use of science and the use of litigation. And each one of those venues and decision-making processes has its strengths and has its weaknesses, but they're not necessarily designed for conflict resolution. So I just explored some of those venues, and I left this place believing you know, the status quo uh, was insufficient, or at least it left a lot to be desired. And I tried to just sketch a few options and alternatives for how this place might be managed differently in the future. A couple years after my Tongass work, I started to get interested in what I uh, labeled place-based national forest legislation. And part of this was precipitated by a congressional bill that was introduced in the state of Montana by Senator John Tester that would basically codify particular forest management prescriptions uh, in a piece of law telling two national forests how it shall be managed in terms of a timber treatments, or timber targets, restoration objectives, and protected lands. And this interest in place-based legislation grew very quickly in the United States, in the Western United States, with other very similar bills introduced into Congress. Um, so, and they all have very similar themes, and that's what I'm gonna talk about a little bit today. Now some of, the, so what I did is look at 12 of these different initiatives going on in the Western United States, and the Tongass Futures Roundtable is included in this. And now some of these initiatives were seeking place-based legislation, and some of these groups decided instead of seeking legislation that they were gonna seek very similar objectives but go through, th try to do things through a memorandum of understanding or some other means. Uh, so we also had an, all 12 of these, minus the Tongass Futures Roundtable, come to Missoula for a two-day symposium two summers ago to try to figure out, have these groups tell their stories. What do they want 
what is their source of frustration? How, do they, how do they, would they like to get to these particular places? So from this sample, uh, I like to pull out what I consider to be some of these most defining themes and common characteristics and where the Tongass might fit into this. <laughs> so the first, very easy to spot, is just frustration with the status quo and a desire for change. This is, after all, why these groups are introducing legislation or why they're trying to get a memorandum of understanding with the Forest Service. Some of the sources of this frustration are uh, what many people consider to be a broken forest planning process. Now keep in mind that a lot of these initiatives were, be were being formed during the Bush era NIFMA regulations. A uh, lot of lack of uncertainty during this, t during this decade of planning. Um, a lot of people have a frustration with Forest Service budgets. You know, there are these Forest Service budgets are annually upended in terms of fire management. There's also a frustration with the sort of stovepipe nature of Forest Service budgets that have not allowed for integrated restoration management in the past. A lot of frustration with the United States Forest Service organizational culture. A lot of frustration, you know, folks believing that, that the agency is reluctant to try new things. And one of the most surprising th uh, themes that we find uh, it, I'm going to go back here. I'm going to come back to the restoration. Okay. I think it would be better to do it here. So one of these other themes that we find is a, is a search for more certainty uh, in national forest management. And this manifests itself in a lot of different ways. One, it's why, you know, Senator Tester, Senator Wyden, and some of these collaboratives are seeking place-based legislation and memorandums of understanding. And they're also seeking more additional certainty through uh, land designations, more secure land bases. And this is something that we see throughout the Western United States where groups are trying to find some sort of secure land base in terms of restoration areas and priorities for restoration, areas designated for active timber forest management, and then protected lands legislation or protected land status in terms of wilderness and special management. The most controversial theme of a lot of these initiatives is this interest in finding a more securing, a more uh, certain timber supply. And this has been the most controversial part of Senator Tester's bill. And there's a timber treatment mandate that would basically dictate how many acre, or, uh, acre feet, how many board feet of timber could be mechanically treated on two national forests. And there's also an emphasis on stewardship contracting, something that I'd like to come back to. And I think this relates to this idea of certainty because of the highly uncertain congressional appropriations process. So people are looking for these alternative ways of funding some of these restoration uh, initiatives. A, th a third theme, landscape scale restoration and its relationship to communities and industry. A restoration is, a, is commonly identified as this zone of agreement. Uh, there's, there's a lot of emphasis in the lower 48 in the Western United States, obviously on fuels reduction and thinning, but the emphasis on restoration goes beyond that as defined in the Healthy Forest Restoration Act, for example, to include a lot of other restoration items from water, roads, invasives, et cetera. And these groups also put a number of parameters or sideboards on these restoration objectives in terms of prohibitions on new road building, road density standards, and the like. So there's a lot of agreement when it comes to restoration, but it seems from these groups that some of that um, agreement breaks down when we move from dry site forest of ponderosa pine into more complex forest types, like lodgepole, for example and mixed severity regimes is where you start to see increasing disagreement among these groups in terms of defining restoration needs and objectives. What you also have among several of these stakeholders is a belief that there is an imperative to do this restoration work. And this goes beyond the timber industry. 
to include uh, a number of conservation partners, that there is a management imperative. And this imperative goes beyond restoration to also include wildland restoration needs. Now, one thing I'd like to talk about during the, I think one of the big differences, what's going on in the, in the Western United States than Alaska, is the importance of motorized recreation. And for a lot of conservation interests in the lower 48, th many of those groups consider motorized recreation to be the biggest threat to national forests. And they believe that they, there is a urgency to deal with motorized recreation because every year those, that issue is not resolved, there is a belief that you're gonna lose that acreage to possible wilderness designation. And I think that drives a lot of these groups to the collaborative table. So my fourth and, and, and final slide that I'll talk about one of these themes uh, is conflict resolution and the desire for more public participation in national forest management. And this is something that we, I, at our symposium in Missoula, we were overwhelmed with this interest among these, these groups in collaboration, wanting a seat at the table, but wanting a seat in a more formal and institutionalized way. So when you look at these bills and you look at some of these agreements, you're, trying, you're, you're seeing that groups are trying to get uh, collaboration in a more structured and institutionalized way. So creations of advisory boards and sub-advisory committees and the like. Uh, one of the narratives that I think is interesting here is in terms of restoration and collaboration. So the way that this story goes that we were told over and over again is that uh, this emphasis on restoration is, is going to require a different sort of environmental strategy. That our, our current set of environmental laws like NIFMA and NEPA and the Endangered Species Act are wonderful ways of stopping things from happening. Excellent defensive strategies from, from compelling an agency to stop doing or refrain from doing a particular thing like building a road or preventing a timber sale. But when we move into ecological restoration and forest restoration, th the argument goes that we're gonna need collaboration in order to get us there. We're going to need a more offensive strategy that goes beyond these legal tools. Now, because of this, there has been a considerable amount of backlash and controversy over the last few years about the amount of collaboration that is taking place. Uh, part of it is who is included. I mean, there's a, there's a criticism here that by a number of groups that these collaboratives are self-selected, they're not transparent, they're exclusive. Uh, and then what, we're, what I'd like to talk about during the question and answer period as well is how these collaborative groups and some of these initiatives fit into this existing body of environmental law how these collaboratives like the Tongas Futures Roundtable or Senator Tester's bill or the Collaborative Forest Landscape Scale Restoration Act uh, fit into and interact with laws like the Federal Advisory Committee Act and NEPA and the Endangered Species Act and this possible mismatch. So I'd, what I'd like to do is just end abruptly there and uh, and take the remainder of my time for questions and some comparison with the, uh, the adversarial legalistic approach of American environmental law in the United States with British Columbia. So I'll, George, I'll, I'll give it to you at this point. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, as you can see, we're, we have some uh, fertile fields of plow here during our panel discussion. Our next uh, speaker is Professor George Hoberg. He is Professor of uh, Forest Resources Management at UBC, where he headed that department uh, from uh, 2001 to 2006. He specializes in environmental and natural resource policy and government. Uh, he received his uh, Bachelor of Sciences from UC Berkeley and his uh, uh, doctorate from MIT. Uh, 
He's a political science by, uh, scientist by training um, and taught public policy and American politics at UBC for 13 years before uh, becoming affiliated with the Faculty of Forestry uh, full-time in 2001. He is the co-author of numerous publications, but uh, in particular, the uh, Canadian uh, Tenure Policies and Sustainable Forest <coughs> Management. He's written books on BC forest policy, environmental policy in the United States, toxic substances regulation, and in addition, uh, has edited uh, two books uh, on comparative uh, Canadian U.S. policies and the U.S. influence uh, on Canada. Let me welcome George Hobart. See if I can do this faster than Martin. Well, maybe not. Do I win? Hi, I'm uh, incredibly happy uh, to be here. It's been uh, a, a just a wonderfully welcoming visit, and uh, like Martin, it's uh, been humbling to be in the landscape. Uh, it's humbling to be on the ancestral lands of the uh, Clinket and uh, Haida people. So uh, I'm very pleased to be here, especially to talk about my favorite subject, which is the Great Bear Rainforest and the efforts within British Columbia to uh, protect as much biodiversity there as possible. Uh, it really does reveal some quite interesting contrasts with uh, what's happening up here in the Tongass. So I want to talk first about those uh, different national styles of governance and then go, I'm going to basically tell the story of uh, the Great Bear Rainforest Agreements and their implementation from the 1990s when the issues began to uh, the present. Um, focusing on the 2006 land use plan and how it was produced and then especially the struggle over implementing EBM. I actually have a slide that also compares the outcomes of how much old growth is protected uh, in the two jurisdictions that may be fodder for uh, some discussion and I'll, I'll draw out some general themes. One of the most important of which is the extraordinary success of collaboration here uh, was made possible by uh, some constructive ambiguity which facilitated agreement. That same condition made, is making it extremely difficult to implement ecosystem-based management and leading to a great deal of frustration. This uh, map is for Gordon Orion's. Uh, obviously it has a BC bias given what it mostly, uh, so, but, but it's essentially a, a ecosystem with the um, national lines drawn on them. It's actually quite extraordinary the, the, how the division in jurisdiction exists and the consequences of it are that it's so hard for us to talk to each other uh, in, in a number of ways, uh, but it's the same ecosystem. And, it's a, and there's the politics on that ecosystem, at least the structure of political interests, is pretty much the same in both uh, jurisdictions. Uh, Aboriginal peoples have been here uh, for 10,000 years or so, uh, using the forests for uh, cultural and uh, sustenance purposes. Uh, in modern times, um, uh, timber interests have profited off the land base. Uh, environmental uh, interests increasingly uh, are struggling to uh, retain as much of the uh, or original natural beauty as possible. And so the, the, the structure of that conflict is essentially the same, but it's within uh, political systems that are actually extremely different. And there's one of the things that I do uh, as, as part of my scholarship as I'm, I, I actually have, I have American roots, but I've been in Canada for 25 years. I'm now a dual citizen, and I've just been fascinated by the differences between uh, the two countries' governance systems and their consequences for policy. So in BC, uh, what we call a policy style, I'll refer to it as, uh, as bargaining. And it's quite interesting because um, Martin showed that very provocative uh, head pounding thing. What would you do if you didn't have a wall to bang your head against? That's really what the BC story is. Uh, and and, and th try to think about it like that. Uh, in Alaska, 
there's legalism, right? I mean, that's the, uh, you can call it adversary legalism. You put an adjective in front of it, but essentially the distinctive feature of the American system of policymaking is the uh, role of the courts, which is created by a particular form of statute, which is created by the separation of powers. So that's one key difference I'll get to. Another key difference is the level of jurisdiction. In British Columbia, forests are managed by the province. In, uh, up here, there are state forests, but the, the uh, preeminent landowner and therefore the preeminent regulator is the federal government of the United States. So that's a very big difference. The U.S., I mean, I'm sorry, in B.C., uh, our statutes are what we call enabling. They authorize the government to do things, but they don't require them to actually do anything, especially by a particular time frame. And the result of that is that it forces uh, policy to be made by discussions among interest groups, uh, not by courts. Uh, there is no mechanism for environmental groups to have uh, an action in court to bring a, a government to court to force it to do something it's reluctant to do because we don't have the same kind of um, specific statutes that have specific numbers in them and then deadlines on it that require actions from a particular time. We, we say, please protect the environment uh, as soon as possible. And, uh, and so it does take the courts out of um, th that kind of policy to the same extent. Aboriginal law is quite different because it's set in the Constitution Act of Canada, and so courts have played an extremely big role there. I'm not going to talk about that in any detail, but I'd be, uh, I'd be happy to. It's, it's one of the things I studied. We also, we don't have treaties or any kind of settled land claims in the overall majority of British Columbia, especially the area that we're uh, talking about. We have a new set of uh, quite extraordinary collaborative governance agreements, uh, which Ken Lertzman talked about yesterday, and I'll be referring to those as well. Up here across the border, things are quite different. There's federal jurisdiction. There's legislation that is extraordinarily specific, uh, which gives uh, courts a role that is unprecedented in other jurisdictions. You actually, one of the interesting things about it is people in New York and California and Ohio can say something about what goes on in Alaskan forests. They can't do that in Canada. Uh, people in Toronto and Montreal don't have uh, input on what happens in uh, forests in British Columbia. Uh, and uh, I understand there are some issues about, you know, the, the, the um, land claim settlement up here, but, but basically it's mostly settled, and that creates some quite different um, conditions I in the two jurisdictions. So uh, how do we, given those differences, what happens? And so l this is the story of uh, collaboration in British Columbia for these uh, new uh, land use plans. Prior to the beginning of this process, so I'll call it prior to 1991, it was a huge shift in BC politics because everything was run by uh, conservative governments prior to then. And for a decade in the 1990s, we had a NDP government, which was a, a social democratic government. You can think of it as the left of the Democratic Party. Uh, there were a couple of quite big shifts that occurred that forced government and industry to the table, uh, one of which is a new form of power for environmental groups who lacked access to the federal government because of our uh, division of powers. They lacked access to courts because of the structure of our statutes. So what they did is they went to the international marketplace and began attacking the practices of uh, BC forest products companies with uh, big box retailers first in Europe and then in the United States. And that created a significant amount of power for those groups and forced industry to take them seriously in a way that they hadn't done before that. The second big shift was a, a quite dramatic shift in governance where prior to uh, essentially the late 1990s, the government of British Columbia's formal policy was to ignore the constitutional assertions for title by Aboriginal groups. Uh, there, were, there were treaty negotiations going on but they essentially treated Aboriginal groups a as if they did not exist in a legal form. Through a series of court cases beginning in 1997 and culminating in 2004, the government of BC was forced to acknowledge uh, the e pre-existing title of uh, Aboriginal groups. And as a result, in order to move forward with any um, imperatives for the government needed to consult and needed to accommodate with First Nations. And this led to a significant, basically 180 degree shift in the government where they moved from uh, reluctance and denial of Aboriginal rights to actually pursuing a new relationship, it was called, through shared decision making over land use. 
and, and that w has, has led to some quite extraordinary changes. So those were the two big shifts in governance. Chronologically, the campaign began in uh, 1995, when after uh, their success in Clackwood Sound, which again Ken Lertzman talked about yesterday, they moved up the coast to begin demanding greater protection uh, in the central and north coast regions, which they, for the purposes of campaigns, created the more evocative name Great Bear Rainforest, which again, in a, in a significant political victory, is now used uh, as a, a, a virtually formal title by the government and other interests. They blocked roads at first, uh, but most importantly, they engaged in these market-based campaigns uh, targeting large purchasers. As they began that, the government uh, was in the midst of a strategic land use planning process that it had divided regionally throughout the province. And they started one of these in the central and north coast, but the environmentalists boycotted those processes because the government had put a cap on the amount of protected areas uh, that would be uh, negotiable. And the environmentalists said they can't live with that, so they essentially boycotted the process. What happened to about that first power shift, though, is because the market campaign ended up getting traction, the forest products companies working in the area decided they had to deal with environmentalists. So they began engaging in side discussions, which were actually secret. Only industry and only environmentalists, not communities, First Nations, or governments didn't even know about this was going on. They announced an agreement uh, that essentially the industry would suspend logging in areas that uh, environmentalists cared about the most, and the environmentalists uh, agreed to suspend their market campaign and to join the uh, LRMP, that land use planning process. So then they, got, they came back inside um, the process and engaged in a series of discussions, the first stage of which was a framework agreement in 2001, and, the, and that agreement really set the terms for what's happened for the rest of it. The parties to that were the government, First Nations, environmentalists, and companies. 20% of the region was set aside as protected, another 11% that they couldn't agree on was deferred, and the remainder was to be governed by a lighter touch logging practice referred to as ecosystem-based management. In order to help define what to protect uh, and where to have EBM, uh, they created a science team called the Coast in the, uh, Information Team, and uh, they were uh, es essentially set off to design um, the system. As that was going on, the uh, land use planning, the collaborative multi-stakeholder land use planning process is still going on as well. Those things didn't actually end up coordinating very well. Environmentalists were spending a lot more time and being a lot more effective in the science team, and industry was spending a lot more time and being a lot more effective in the planning tables. And that's had consequences which persist uh, to this day. But the planning tables did come up with consensus rec uh, recommendations of 2004. Imagine that, by the way, consensus recommendations. So they succeeded at doing that. And after the, the general stakeholders uh, did this, First Nations were actually part of those agreements, but the, the government committed to a separate government-to-government -government, uh, uh, process, which took another two years to finalize the lines on the map and some of the rules. And that was really the uh, beginning of the, um, uh, that government-to-government -government, uh, new shared authority arrangement. Uh, the big decision was announced in February in 2006. I, I was able to go there uh, to see Premier Campbell uh, announce this. It was actually quite extraordinary because at the, uh, the podium were uh, the Premier of the province, the representative of the Crown, uh, the First Nations chiefs from the region, the head of the Sierra Club, Greenpeace and Forest Ethics, and the head of the major forest companies, all standing up uh, on the podium uh, celebrating this extraordinary agreement. Uh, forest Ethics declared victory. They declared that we won. Uh, Greenpeace declared victory. Do you ever remember them doing that before or since? Do environmental groups declare victory? I, it seems like it's a little uh, inconsistent with the general approach of, of uh, uh, wanting to appear to always want and demand more. So did they win? Well, what they got was uh, a complex new land use planning framework. That's the big map. The, Drill down a bit just in terms of the numbers, basically uh, one third was protected. Although in British Columbia, we have this very funny thing where we have this zone in the Great Bear Rainforest area, 5% where tourism and mining are allowed, but not logging. Is there anywhere else that has decided that mining is more sustainable than logging? I, I'm not aware. Uh, but, but anyway, we call it protected. 
Uh, we don't call them protected areas here now because First Nations uh, disagreed with that characterization. They wanted to have cultural use of the forest, so they're actually referred to as conservancies, and they are now uh, put into uh, in, in, in the statutory framework. They are now uh, in law. So 33% uh, uh, was protected. 67% is to be governed by ecosystem-based management. But the question was, what is that? And this is a very definition of constructed ambiguity. It basically lays out the two stools of what you want. You want biodiversity conservation and you want human well-being, but it tells you virtually nothing about what the rules should be or how to resolve tensions between those uh, things where they are. And basically, we are still struggling uh, with that issue. In terms of deciding the specifics of EBM rules, uh, the parties in that 2006 agreement committed to uh, full implementation of EBM by March 2009, uh, but that definition was uncertain. And the, the part of that that I've been taking, and I would argue it's actually the single most important dividing issue, is uh, old growth representation. Uh, the coast information team, that science team, <coughs> recommended that at the landscape level, uh, the, uh, the, the target should be, the mandated target should be 70% of the range of natural variability. So a relatively high uh, target, although when we get to looking at, in comparison to the Tongass, we'll see it's not, it's not that high. Uh, but the uh, planning tables, the multi-stakeholder consultation tables, and industry and government uh, wanted to have 30%, and that was the number that stuck in 2006 policy. They, they committed to 30% uh, retention, uh, but with full, there, the idea w there will be more by uh, 2009. And to environmentalists, the more, the full implementation meant what the science team recommended, the 70 percent. But the March 2009 framework, and again, I'm getting some details here because part of the whole point of this is that the details really matter. If you don't understand the details of the legal framework set out, you don't actually know how much of old growth is being protected. So 50 percent uh, was protected in the new rule set out in March 2009, and they punted full implementation to a further date, 2014. So you see the logic here. We can't resolve the conflict, so we'll go a little bit further uh, to protect an, an old growth, and then we'll punt the uh, bigger issues until some future date that seems a long way away. But if, let's take a look at this 2009 decision. The preamble uh, to it, which by the way is non-binding, it said so very clearly, said that the target, not at the landscape level, but for the region as a whole, would be 50% of the range of natural variation uh, for old growth forests. And, but they said that the basic, the rules are set out in these very complex tables of what uh, the default targets are. That's what it looks like. I don't expect you to be able to read that, but if you uh, drill down here, you can see that for each landscape unit, each individual geographic unit of the region, there's a default target, uh, the, uh, which is basically where they want you to be, either uh, 30, 50, 70, or 100. The ones that are 100 are essentially those that are already uh, significantly logged or degraded, so they're trying to pr essentially protect them. But then there's the risk managed targets, which Ken mentioned yesterday is really uh, the high risk target, which is uh, 30%. And um, the overall average that they were designed to shoot for was meant to be 50%. And so the map, uh, according to environmentalists and according to the government, had changed significantly to the pre-2006 protected areas where there's not much green, to the post-2009 where there's a lot of dark green, which is protected areas, and then lighter shades of green, which are various forms of retention um, under the ecosystem-based management rules. And then in 2014, if they're so-called full implementation, this is the vision of uh, forest ethics and their friends, uh, it, there would be significantly more protection. But again, if we take a step back and look at the fine print of the 2009 decision, uh, which is one of the things I like to do, uh, that the fault target needs to be attained unless it doesn't fall below the 30%, okay, so that's your, that's your threshold. Uh, that information and sharing and consultation with First Nations is conducted. A landscape unit habitat assessment for species at risk and regionally important wildlife is completed by a qualified professional. The old forest is retained to provide sufficient habitat to sustain species at risk and regionally important wildlife based on the above assessment. And an adaptive management plan is developed and implemented to the extent practicable. Do those um, exemptions sound demanding to you? 
Uh, in fact, uh, the, th that one, the information sharing and consultation with First Nations is already required by law. Uh, landscape unit habitat assessment for feces at risk is already required by law. The old forest is retained and provided uh, is already required by law. An adaptive management plan is developed and implemented to the extent practical. It's not required by law. But is that a, a meaningful constraint? I'm, uh, I'm not sure. I'm being a little bit facetious here, but part of the point I'm trying to show is that the, it says 50 as a vague target, but my reading of it is the 50 really is more like 30. And 30 is more like where we started, and it's not very much, and it's not ecosystem-based management. So that's why I pay attention to the implementation and the fine print of those rules. So just to distill things down, science team recommended 70 in 2004. The planning table recommended 30% uh, 2006. Uh, it was adopted as an interim target uh, in 2009. That what we now have in place is the 50% regional target, but fine print suggests it's really more like 30%, uh, and we have a new commitment for full implementation by uh, 2014. So what does this tell us? And beginning to wrap up now, there we can look, think about what the barriers to implementation are. Well, the first barrier to implementation is what makes for successful agreement, constructive ambiguity, actually undermines the ability to, um, uh, to implement the framework under certain conditions. And those conditions include the existence of science. Our science is poor. Uh, we have ideas, we call things science teams, but when we look at what the core ask of science is, which is can you tell me how much old growth I need to uh, preserve in order to maintain the values I care about, we actually don't understand the relationships very well in this region. And in fact, most of the science that went into the Coast Information Team documents was from other jurisdictions. There was very little indigenous uh, research that had been done uh, here. And also, it's just the, it's the political issue, the idea of decision space. There's too big a gap between what's ecologically acceptable to environmentalists, and I think they're, they're the, what the least that they could accept was 70% when they agreed to that in the Coast Information Team discussions. But what's economically acceptable to, fir to companies and some First Nations is much lower. Uh, they don't see themselves as being able to make a profit at the level of uh, protection that environmentalists consider uh, sufficient. And so there's just too big a gap there. We haven't been able to resolve that controversy. It simply keeps getting uh, punted down the road. So environmentalists have declared success in 2006. Uh, is that working out well? Well, one thing to do is to compare it to what's going on elsewhere. And I'd really appreciate if uh, you have any comments on these numbers or can help me get better ones. What I've done is taken the 2008 uh, Tongass Forest Plan, and it, the numbers are quite clear in there, about uh, the percent of old growth that's protected in reserves and standard and guidelines, and it's very high. And then I've taken uh, the percent of old growth with the, our coastal western hemlock zone, which is sl slightly under, um, underrepresented in the protected areas, and added to that, even if it's 50 percent of the range of natural variation, for the remaining two-thirds of the land, you come up with a total of about 60%. So that's great progress from where it was before, but it's the same ecosystem as exists in the Tongass. And British Columbians, despite celebrating their success, uh, are nowhere near the level of protection that is being afforded in Alaska. So to conclude, uh, it shows an operation really of a fundamentally different institutional framework. So you take the wall away to bang your head on, uh, but there's actually always different walls, aren't there? Or I don't know, maybe, maybe when, when there's no wall, then the, the, the sense of where the struggle is uh, just changes in fundamental ways. There's always uh, underlying it the political divisions between environmentalists who are trying to essentially maximize uh, protection of values that they cherish and uh, companies that are trying to uh, make a buck off of industrial logging. Uh, it is, was really an extraordinary interest of collaborative decision making that was brought about by those two very powerful uh, shifts in the structure of influence in the region. Uh, environmentalists, uh, First Nations, government industry, all were able to come to agreement on some important rules, but they didn't come to agreement on uh, other parts of the framework, and we're still working on that. That, that conflict has essentially been postponed. And I guess what I'd leave you with is the thought of 
does the level of protection currently afforded, if it's 50% or if it's closer to 30%, does that really represent what the idea of ecosystem-based management is, that you're supposed to base management on the, uh, the ecological features of this region, which are quite extraordinary because of the lack of uh, fire disturbance? Uh, it doesn't seem to me that 30, 50% is, is enough. Uh, thank you very much. Again, thank you, George. What we're going to do is take a five-minute stand-up, but just five minutes. And uh, I, those of you who know me know I carry a timer. Uh, it will be five minutes, and uh, at that point, we'll start the panel portion of our program. So get up, stretch your legs, and uh, be back on time. <laughs>